Hello everyone and welcome to our Tech Excellence Meetup. Our vision is to raise the bar of technical excellence across the world. The following are some of our uh, past speakers as well as our upcoming speakers. So uh, please make sure that you've joined us on Meetup so that you get notifications for future events. Also, you can uh, like this video if you find it useful and feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Additionally, you can also follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter to get uh, informed about our future events. And also, if you have any technical questions, uh, you can ask them on our uh, GitHub uh, community. So uh, for today, I'm really excited that we will be joined by Bas Dijkstra, who will be talking about uh, improving your integration testing efforts with uh, contract testing. And Bas works as a test automation consultant and trainer at on test automation. And I find this quite a really insightful topic because there's not that many teams and companies who are uh, familiar or practicing contract uh, testing effectively. So I think this is a great opportunity uh, for, for learning. Um, so yeah, thanks Bas for, for this session today. And I guess maybe we could start with screen sharing. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that introduction, Valentina. And, and thank you for having me, of course. All right. If all goes well, you should be able to see my screen now. Yes. Is that, yes. Could you just, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, so, yeah, let's dive right in. Uh, I'm not going to tell you too much about myself. Valentina did a, did a wonderful job of introducing me. So uh, that's not really a whole lot else to say um i'm quite excited to to join you today and to tell you a little bit about um yeah how to improve your integration testing efforts with contract testing it's all in the title of the presentation really um so for a little bit of history this is what applications have been looking like have looked like for decades and monolithic applications where graphical user interface data access layers business logic layers were all really tightly coupled um and developing and deploying new versions of that application required you to deploy the entire application into um into a, an environment could be a qa environment could be a production environment any environment really um but the world is changing, and um, I'm probably preaching to the choir here. I'm, I'm assuming that you already know the world is changing. So a lot of companies, a lot of teams are slowly moving away from monolithic applications to a much more microservices-based architecture, much more distributed software development and distributed software design where an application is built out of a number of loosely coupled um, independent components. And that number might be dozens or hundreds or sometimes even thousands if you look at the, at the, the, the really big systems. Uh, and all these independent components are developed and deployed and run and maintained and cared for by different teams, different departments, sometimes even different organizations. Um, and they typically add, they, they communicate uh, via another via APIs over HTTP or via queues or, or, or GRPC or whatever. Um, and, but the main thing is that they're all uh, lo loosely coupled independent services that together provide some sort of higher level business service and provide some higher level business value to an end user of that system. Um, and while that the whole Microsoft shift to microservices is wonderful for, again, distributed software development, parallel software development, and microservices-based architectures have lots and lots of advantages. 
um, add again parallel development. It's easier to swap out single components. Uh, a change in in one the uh, a change in one component doesn't mean that the entire application has to be redeployed. It's just that one single component. Um, so that's all wonderful, but um, that shift towards microservices based uh, distributed and microservices based architectures and software systems um, also comes with its challenges and especially in uh, the field of testing um, because at, at, at any point there might be different teams working on new versions of their comp of the components that they are responsible for and they want to deploy that into an environment maybe into production at some point um and that and, but they don't want to break stuff or let's just assume they don't want to break stuff which means that the question that you see on the screen right now are all individual components and services able to communicate with one another um needs to be answered over and over and over and again every time um one of those components gets an update is um have a, it is has a new release has additional features has some kind of changes at at open you want um you don't want to introduce any integration issues any breaking changes so this question becomes more and more and more relevant the more distributed your system becomes um the traditional way in which teams and testers and developers have tried to answer that question is by, um, let's call it more traditional approaches to uh, large scale integration and end to end testing, uh, which focuses on the integration of everything at once. Basically what that comes down to is um, trying to construct or to spin up uh, a testing environment that has all of these different individual components in the right state with the right data at a certain point in time and have them all configured so they talk to one another properly and so that you can test them. And the more distributed your system becomes, the harder this gets. Um, I sometimes compare that to um, an attempt to juggle the live chainsaws um, it might work, but when it doesn't work, it gets bloody pretty quickly. Um, it's difficult. Uh, this is a challenge. And, and, and how I sometimes see teams and organizations address this is to have separate people or even uh, in separate, separate teams whose primary task just uh, is to set up and maintain these test environments and do all the code, uh, the, the, the coordination and uh, constantly ask all that, do you have something that's ready so we can do the large scale integration and end to end testing? Um, the more distributed your system becomes, the harder this gets. And the more distributed your development becomes, the harder this gets. Um, so it can be done, but it's not pretty. It takes a lot of effort. And more often than not, it takes way too much time and it actually slows you down and slows you down a lot. Um, which means um, we probably need a better approach. And one of those approaches that I think can help you is uh, contract testing is the topic of today's session. Um, so there are two fundamental differences between that traditional approach that the traditional integration end-to-end -end testing approach in distributed systems and contract-based integration testing. Um, the first one is that instead of focusing on the integration of everything at once, contract-based integration testing primarily focus on the integration of individual consumers and providers, which means that instead of seeing if A, B, C, and D can work together, it focuses on, is A able to communicate with B? 
is be able to communicate with C and is be able to communicate with D. Um, so and and by doing that, by by shifting that focus well, downwards, basically, or or uh, zooming in, narrowing the scope, it tries to break down that whole puzzle of integration and end-to-end -end testing. Um, the other difference, yeah, and I think that's an even more important difference and a real key to why contract testing is is um i think that is is a very um valuable approach a very promising approach for uh, a lot of these again integration end to end testing challenges in distributed systems is that traditional integration end to end testing is synchronous which means that if you want to test that a and b can communicate with one another a and B need to de be deployed and in the right state uh, with the right data in the same environment at some specific point in time because they actually communicate with one another. And they need to, A needs to send requests to B and B needs to answer to those requests with responses and send them back to A. Um, and again, that requires A and B or hey, if you go full-blown full cell a b c d and all the hundreds or thousands of other components that you've got in your system all to be in the same test environment at the same time um contract-based integration and end-to-end -end testing is asynchronous which means that again let's take as an example the integration between consumer a and provider b um contract testing can be done completely asynchronously which means that consumer a and provider b do not have to be in some shared test environment at the same point in time sure the contract testing flow and we'll look at that in more detail in a minute um it requires both consumer a and provider b to do something but they can both do their tasks at their due diligence that fulfill their responsibilities of the contract testing cycle as part of their own build and deployment cycle eh? in their own pipeline basically and because what they need the the information that they need to exchange that's in the contract and there is there's a contract and uh, the fact that there's a contract which contains all the relevant information uh, means that the process can be entirely asynchronous, which makes it much, much easier to do this in a distributed environment because you don't need, uh, you don't have to have a shared test environment where all these components are available at the same point in time with the, again, in the right state with the right data and so on um and it is all about uh contract testing is all about expectations and and there are three different types of contract testing basically i'm going to talk about um uh, two of them and you, i'm going to show you two of them in this session and in this demo um you've got consumer driven contract testing which is what we're going to look at first, which is um, sort of the default approach for a lot of people who talk about contract testing. Um, and I see that with my current client as well. They immediately start talking about consumer-driven contract testing um, without first asking themselves, well, what's the best approach for our context? Because there are three different ways of doing this. Um, and consumer, as we'll see, uh, after the demo, consumer-driven contract testing is necessarily the best approach for each context. Uh, there are three different ones, and, and um, different contexts may require different approaches. Uh, but we'll look at consumer-driven contract testing first. Um, and with consumer-driven contract testing, it's all about the expectations that a consumer has about the behavior of the provider. In the, the live demo that I'm going to show you, um, I've got three 
components, three services, two consumers and one provider. And both those consumers, they rely on the same provider, obviously. So um, it's within the context of a web shop um, where I've got two consumer components, a customer consumer, which uh, manages data around the customers of that web shop, and an order component, which manages the data around the orders that are placed in that web shop. And because both customers and orders have addresses, um, there's a single address provider service which manages all the address data and provides that data to both the customer consumer and the order consumer. Um, and these consumers, they have expectations around that, around the behavior of that address provider. So for example, if a customer consumer retrieves data from the address provider through, for example, um, an HTTP GET to an endpoint that says slash address, then an address ID, and that address provider sends a response in return. Um, there might be at the customer consumer probably has all kinds of expectations around well, how does the address provider behave and what does the response returned by the address provider look like in certain situations? For example, what happens um, if I post data to address to, to create a new data uh, entry or a new address entry on the side of the address provider, for example? Um, they probably have expectations around uh, what does the response look like if I do an HTTP GET. Um, and that's not just for a successful HTTP GET. So when you send uh, an HTTP GET to slash address slash address ID and that address ID is valid and it exists in the database of the address provider, so actual data is returned, but also what happens if um, that address cannot be found or what happens if the address ID is invalidly formatted, for example, and the same for the HTTP delete. So there's all kinds of expectations that that customer consumer can have about the behavior of the address provider in different situations. Um, and consumer driven contract testing or CDCT in short um, is a technique supported by tools um, that formalizes the expectations in contracts. Uh, and the tooling also allows you to automatically check that the provider meets the expectations that are set by the consumer and are written down in those contracts. Um, and there's benefit. Eh, there's there's uh, benefits for both consumers and providers in adopting and implementing consumer-driven contract testing. Um, the biggest benefit for a provider is uh, the fact that they can develop and refactor without fear. Um, we talked about this with, our, with my current client today where I'm helping them set up and implement con uh, contract testing. They said, well, yes, uh, we, they were working on the provider side and said, yeah, we made some changes that we thought were necessary and now we get all these complaints from our consumers that they um, that we broke stuff, uh, and we don't want that. Uh, and we actually want to provide good service to our consumers. Um, they don't have contract testing pl in place yet. We've got to work on that. Um, but um, if they would have had contract testing in place, they would have had a safety net to develop and refactor without fear because um, they know what their consumers expect from them because that's in the contracts. And so as long as they meet all of the expectations from their consumers, they can basically do whatever they want. They can um, introduce new features. They can use new versions of frameworks. They can totally rewrite their service, basically, as long as the external behavior still matches the expectations um, that are written down in the contracts, they can basically do whatever they want. Um, and for consumers, it's obviously a way to build trust 
in the providers. I had to start trusting the providers more and more. That so they know that they have a well, nothing's ever guaranteed, but they have um, they should have a much higher level of more much higher level of confidence in that their consumers can actually or that their, that the provider that they rely on actually still does what they want them to do, what they expect them to do. Um, how the tooling works is um, and basically summarized in this picture here that I totally stole from someone else. Um, the way this work, uh, the way um, consumer-driven contract testing tooling works is um, uh, the consumer generates a contract, writes down its, its expectations about behavior of the provider in a contract. Um, and that contract is um, then also, uh, it's immediately input for generating a mock provider. Uh, so uh, a provider that behaves exactly as is written down in the contract, which can then be used by the consumer itself to test its own implementation. So you immediately get, uh, you get basically you get a mock provider for free if you write the contract. If, if once you do consumer driven contract testing. And so that's the consumer side. So um, these consumer driven contract testing tools, they can, uh, A, they give you a means to generate the contract, but also it immediately, A, you get a mock provider for free, which you can use to, to test your own implementation. And then that contract is passed to the provider. And on the provider side, had the same tooling generate from that contract generates a mock consumer that's going to send the requests that are written down in the contract. And, and, and those are sent to an actual implementation of the provider, so an actual running provider. And then the responses that the provider returns are compared with the expectations in the contract. And, uh, and that's a means to check whether the actual in provider implementation meets all of the expectations in all of the contracts uh, supplied to them by their consumers. Um, and so again, to quickly summarize the flow, we have an API consumer, we have a provider, and um, especially for PACT, which is the consumer-driven contract testing tool that we're going to look at in the live demo that we're going to further discuss for a bit, um, there's a broker. And that broker is basically a central repository for both contracts and uh, contract verification results. So the way the contract testing, consumer-driven contract testing flow works is um, at the, the initiative comes lies with the consumer. So it's the consumer that generates the contract with their expectations about how the provider should behave. And it publishes that contract to the PACT broker. The second step is the provider downloading the contract and verifying its compliance. So it, put, it queries the broker. So to say, well, eh, what contracts are what contracts do you have that are relevant for me? It downloads them and it verifies whether its current implementation is able to meet all of these specifications, all of the expectations that are written down in the contract. The third step is publishing the verification results. And so basically sending the verification results back to that pack broker. And those verification results are then input both for the consumer as well as for the provider to check the verification results and basically determine, is it safe for me to go into production now with this new version, with this new build, with this new release? And because um, and once the verification results are known, both the consumer and the provider can determine, well, are there any, do, do the latest changes that we've make that we've made um, introduce any potential integration issues. 
Um, and the tool eh, in the PACT ecosystem, that's why it says, can I deploy? Uh, that's the name of the tool in the PACT ecosystem that is used to do this, to query the PACT broker and basically to see if it's safe to uh, deploy in production. It's literally what it says. Can I deploy the latest version of uh, the, my latest build into the production environment? Are there any known integration issues? Um, let's see how that works in practice. So I've got a little project here. Uh, by the way, all code uh, that you'll see here is available on GitHub. So um, I fully invite you to have a look at that later on. The link is in the slides. I'm not entirely sure if the slides are going to be available, but it's definitely going to be in the recording. So you can always uh, have a look at that. Um, let's look at the consumer side code first. So again, I've got three components here, a customer consumer, an order consumer, and an address provider. Um, let's quickly look at the customer consumer. Um, I've got some tests here that, uh, again, do two things. It generates, uh, it generates a contract and it tests the implementation of the customer consumer itself. I've organized them around the different HTTP verbs. So these are the ones for the HTTP get because I think those, those are most uh, the most interesting. Um, so, and with PACT, that's uh, the writing these contract tests is a two-stage process. So first of all, I write a PACT, which is basically a set of expectations for a specific part of the behavior of a provider. So in this case, it's, what do I want to happen um, when I send an existing address ID? In that case, uh, the first expectation I have is that the HTTP status code that I expect is equal to 200, which is an okay. Um, but I also have some expectations as a consumer around the shape of the response. And when I say shape, I basically mean uh, what fields uh, are present in the response body and uh, what shape do they have basically what data type are they and that's the typical kind of expectations that you've got so for example what's written here is i expect the response to have an address type field the json response to have an address type field that is a string same for the street for the city for the state or for the country and I've got two fields, a number and zip code, which I expect to have an integer value. Um, I don't care too, as a consumer, I don't care too much about the actual values um, because that's business logic, that's implementation logic of the provider, the actual values that uh, in, in the actual values that correspond to specific address IDs. Um, that's implementation logic. That's something that the provider team itself should test. This contract testing, um, it's a means of making sure that consumer and provider can talk to one another. It's not meant to verify that the provider returns the right data under each and every circum uh, under each and every in each and every uh, situation. Um, because that's the responsibility of the provider team. They should do their uh, functional or acceptance tests or whatever you want to call them to make sure that their service works. And this is purely to see can consumer and provider talk to one another. So this is something you do next to the functional testing of the individual components. It's not something that replaces the functional testing of the individual components. Um, I also have a, uh, an ID field, which is a UUID. This is a helper method uh, supplied by PACT. And this basically comes down to, well, it should be a string, but it should not be, any, uh, not be just any string. It should be a string that matches a certain regular expression. Um, and I then, I've got a unit test that invokes the get address method for the address service client that's used by the customer consumer to invoke the address service uh, that returns 
an address and I check that I can parse that and the values that I expect to be there are actually there. This is testing the implementation of the custom consumer itself, basically. Um, and I have something similar, but with fewer expectations uh, for the situations where the address ID does not exist. And then I expect a 404. And for the situation where the address ID is incorrectly formatted, so it's not a value to UID, in that case, I expect an HTTP 400. Um, the delete contract test is really, really similar. It's just uh, because there's no data to return, it's literally just a 204 for a successful delete or a 400 for, a, for an invalid address ID, basically. Um, when I run these tests on the customer consumer side, it, uh, of course, um, tests the implementation of the custom because that's what the unit tests are for. Um, but it also generates the contract. So it takes a bit because spring and it needs to spin up um, an instance of the customer consumer service itself. Uh, there we go. It's not that slow, actually. Um, so my build to success, uh, all the tests have passed. And one of the things that is... Uh, the result of this test run is a contract. That is, uh, this is a contract between my customer consumer and my address provider. So a contract is always a, a set of expectations, or a, call it an agreement, between a single consumer and a single provider. Which means that uh, in our in our situation, we have an address provider that's being consumed by two different components, uh, the customer consumer and the order consumer. So it needs to match the expectations, fulfill the expectations in both the contracts. Which means that yes, there can be conflicts of interest. As for example, the customer consumer expects A to happen in a certain situation, whereas the order consumer uh, expects B to happen. Uh, and that's exactly the type of uh, integration issue that's really hard to find with traditional means of integration testing. And it's exactly the, at the type of issue at these conflicts of interest because it's all about communication and expectations. Um, and contract testing is basically a way to formalize these discussions about what, do, uh, what does team A expect team B to do. And that, that's where contract testing really, really shines. Um, I am also going to publish my contract to my pack broker. I'll show that to you in a moment. And I'm going to do the exact same thing for the order consumer. And because again, I've got two consumers, both with their own set of expectations around um, what the address provider does. Here we go. Also, that takes about the same amount of time because it's pretty much the same service, just with a different context. And publish that as well. Awesome. Um, let's now briefly switch to Pactflow. Pactflow is um, one of the two di different flavors of um, the Pact Broker. So again, I, I told you a little bit earlier, the Pact Broker is basically the central repository for contracts as well as contract verification results. So refresh quickly. Um, you'll see that, and now that we've run the tests on the consumer side, we have two new integrations here that are known um, in Pactflow. I've got an integration between the order consumer and the address provider, and I've got an integration between the customer consumer and the address provider. Um, so there's some data about the consumer version, not too much because I've been lazy, but this one was published two minutes ago and this one a minute ago. Um, and as you can see, both 
these contracts yeah, because that's what they are and you can even see into detail uh, what's in them so at uh, the packed specification version um, but also the interactions that are specified in uh, the contract and the expectations that the customer has the the consumer has in a certain situation so for example in case of whoops uh a request for address data given or uh, given an order get where the address ID is incorrectly formatted. Uh, when in that case, the order consumer expects a response with an HTTP status code of 400. Um, but all of these interactions and all of that data as of yet is unverified because um, the provider really hasn't done anything. So this is only the consumer side of the consumer-driven contract, consumer contract testing flow. Um, let's switch to the provider. So that's a different project in here that has a contract test where I tell it to query the pack broker for the contracts that are relevant for this provider. And I basically, I tell it to which interactions, which states, which uh, behaviors to verify. Um, and I'm, when I run this test, what it's going to do is, again, query the pack broker for contracts pull those contracts from the pack broker, use those contracts to generate a mock consumer that's going to invoke the actual provider, see if the, re the responses that are returned by the provider match all of the expectations, and publish the verification results back to, uh, back to the pack broker, if I tell it to do so. So if I maven clean and then I need to results is true. So this is a flag that I need to set to automatically publish the test results that pack.verify.publish results because by default um, verification results are not automatically published to the broker. I sort of kind of know what's going to happen here because it's not the first time I'm doing this demo. So, and I like to live a little bit dangerously. So I'm going to immediately publish the results. Uh, so again, this is uh, pooling contracts from the pack broker, verifying the actual implementation of the provider against the expectations for both the customer consumer as well as the order consumer um, and checking if the responses meet all of the expectations and then publishing the verification results back to the broker. There we go. That's done. And if I now refresh i see that uh, both for the order consumer and the address provider as well as for the customer consumer um, it's success which means there are no integration issues the current implementation of the address provider is able to meet all of the expectations both for the order consumer as well as for the customer consumer um, let's very quickly change that situation by just changing, well, just this one. Um, say that eh, in case of a successful delete, for some reason, the customer consumer no longer expects a 204, but just a regular two. This is the customer consumer. So run the tests again. And again, the tests on the customer consumer side will keep on passing because it generates a mock provider that behaves except so that mock provider is going to send the 200 back which means 
the customer consumer will be fine. So these tests will keep on passing. If I now publish this contract again, Black Broker is intelligent enough to see, well, and this is a slightly different version of the contract that's unverified because there's a new contract, even though I was have been too lazy to update the consumer version, but uh, because it's a different contract, because there's a different, uh, the expectation difference from the previous one, um, uh, it, it's there's needs uh, this needs to be re be verified and if I is that still here it is so if I now run the tests on the Atlas provider again which again is going to pull the latest version of the contract from the broker um, but now the the order consumer still expects the HTTP 204 but now the customer consumer expects an HTTP 200 and of course um the address provider can do one of them but not both which means there's a conflict of interest which means there should be at least one failing contract test because and there's no way that the address provider is going to be able to do both um so uh there's a success the build is successful but if we look at the Integration test, we see that this one is still okay, but there's a problem here now and between the customer consumer and the address provider. And if we look at the details, uh, it hasn't even done this one because it stopped here. And it says, well, yeah, it, the request to the provider failed with an exception because the contract says that uh, the expected response was an HTTP 200 but the actual response returned by the address provider was a 204, which means there's now a known integration issue. Again, it's a bit of a simplistic example, but you get, you get the concept, hopefully. Um, and there's now an integra a potential integration issue between the customer consumer and the address provider, because in the case of uh, an HTTP delete, where the address ID is correctly formatted, it expects an HTTP 200, but the address provider re returns an HTTP 204, um, which means that now, a con uh, so it doesn't point any fingers, contract testing or consumer-driven contract testing, but it definitely, uh, it open, uh, it's a means to open up a discussion about who's uh, who needs to change what. Um, and in this case, because the address provider can, well, it can return a status code. It can be 204, it can be 200, um, but it's probably going to be the customer consumer who needs to um, reverse the changes or, or reconsider its expectations, really. Um, so that's traditional, that's what traditional consumer-driven contract testing looks like. Um, I wrote a blog post series that features uh, that all around the same code base that you've seen in this demo. So if you want to have a close look and uh, read everything uh, about the play, about it, setting up, how it works, um, check out this link. Uh, this is part one. It has links to um, the other five articles in that series. Um, CDCT or consumer driven contract testing um, is brilliant it's wonderful um, I wish I'd learned about it a lot sooner but it also has its challenges it's definitely not the perfect solution for everything um, because first of all if you want to use PACT it requires teams to write tests and more tests and be and and, ne and you need uh, a full blown packed implementation and that's effort and effort takes time and it takes money and not everybody wants that um, and so this is a blocker for well, more than a few teams to start doing this in the first place 
Also, and you've probably br briefly seen this, there is some coupling still between a consumer and a provider in the form of those states that you've seen. Um, and because uh, that state is shared between the consumer and the provider because it's defined by the consumer and basically tells the provider um, what kind of initial uh, state it expects. And that doesn't really scale well to large numbers of consumers, which means that if you have a provider with lots of different consumers, you need to take into account all these different states and that, well, at some point, it just doesn't scale anymore. It's also quite hard, uh, what I've seen and what, what basically the contract testing world has seen to get provider teams on board. Um, because not all provider teams want to do this because they say, well, we do what we do and that's it. And it's a lot of work for us and we don't really want to do that. Um, and it's also quite hard to get testers on board because, well, it involves writing unit tests. It involves writing a lot of code. And there's definitely a lot of testers who are perfectly comfortable doing that. But there's also a lot of testers who still struggle with that, who struggle to even have meaningful conversations with developers about unit tests and what it takes. And it's all scary and it's code and I don't really want to do that. And it's the developer's responsibility. Um, so getting testers on board is quite difficult here. And so, and, and these are just a few of the challenges that people, including myself, who've tried that, who've, who've spend time and effort implementing consumer-driven contract testing using PACT have encountered. And that's where, and, and the team behind PACT, uh, the, they, they, they encountered that as well because they themselves, their consultants as well, they've been doing this for years. Um, and that's why they came up with a new way of doing contract testing, which is bidirectional contracts. Um, Immediately, uh, a disclaimer, um, bidirectional contract testing is supported only by Pactflow. And Pactflow, which is the Pact broker that you saw, uh, it's a cloud product. It's also a commercially licensed product. There is a free plan, but that only goes up to five integrations. You, have an, you can have an unlimited amount of users, but you can only have five integrations in there. Um, there is also an open source pack broker, which is basically a, um, a Docker image, which you can deploy everywhere. It supports consumer driven contract testing fine. It does, however, it however does not support bidirectional contract testing. So what you're seeing from this moment on, you can only do with packed flow. And again, packed flow is a commercially licensed product, but I still want to show it to you because um, it does have um quite a few benefits and it's 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 and its biggest benefit is it's easier to get started it's much easier to adopt than traditional consumer driven contract testing so this is the the traditional consumer driven contract testing flow we've seen that we've seen that uh, on paper we've seen that in the live demo um with bidirectional contract testing it's not the consumer who calls the shots, as in consumer-driven contract testing. It's also not the provider who's calling the shots, as in provider-driven contract testing, which is what public APIs typically do, saying, well, this is my contract, this is my specification, good luck. Um, with bidirectional contract testing, both the consumer and the provider um, supply their own version of a contract, so it's not a contract that goes from one party to the other, but both supply their own version of a contract to an independent verification agent, which in this case is also the PAC broker, or and more specifically PAC flow. And it's the PAC broker who then does the verification. So um, the consumer generates and publishes a consumer contract. The provider generates and publishes a provider contract. And it's then the packed broker that does the check for compatibility. So it's again, it's not one party passing the contract to the other side, but now both consumer and provider publish their own contract and it's the packed broker that checks, well, are there any 
potential integration issues. Um, and after that, that's done. Both consumer and provider can again check for compatibility results. This is nothing new. Um, and as I said just uh, a minute ago, bidirectional contract testing is much easier to adopt compared to traditional consumer-driven contract testing. Um, and the reason for that is that with bidirectional contract testing, that doesn't require you, that doesn't require a full-blown packed implementation anymore. You can do, you can generate the consumer version of the contract uh, just with PACT, but you don't necessarily have to do that anymore. Um, for the provider side, well, there's no, uh, PACT doesn't do provider-driven contract testing, so there's no way with PACT to generate a provider contract. But um, a provider contract can be uh, an open API specification, for example, because that's a form of a contract. Um, so let's look at how that works in practice. I'm going to quickly fire up Postman in the meantime and go to a slightly different branch in my code because that features a fourth service called the payment provider. So this is an additional integration that I'm introducing here between the order consumer and a payment provider. The payment provider is a public API, so it, it, it's horribly unsuited for consumer-driven contract testing, but it has a contract. It's open API specification. And um, in our case, let's start again with the consumer side. There's now some additional tests that test the integration between the payment uh, between the order consumer and the payment service provider. Um, but these aren't packed tests anymore. These are just regular integration tests that use a mock version of the payment service provider because. Um, testing payment, uh, testing integration with an actual payment service provider with an actual instance of the payment service provider is not something you can do very often um, because it's third party, public, and yada yada. yada eh? It's really hard to do. So people typically use mocks for that. And one very popular Java library to do that is Wiremock. Um, so in this case, eh, the team already had these integration tests that used a mocked version of the payment service provider written in Wiremock. Um, but these existing tests, uh, you see a couple of them here, um, they can be transformed, they can be used as input for a contract as well. And um, the only thing you need to add is this Wiremock packed generator, which is um, Basically, technically, a listener that you can, or an extension that you, well, service, a mock service request listener. It says so on the tin, really. It's an extension of Wiremock that listens to all the traffic that goes to and from the Wiremock instance when the tests are run, and it generates a contract from that. And that's going to be, because that mock will have the expectations of, how the consumer thinks the payment service provider is going to uh, behave written into the tests. So and that, that's a perfect way to add that, that that's perfectly valid input for the consumer side contract. And if I go, no, the order, run the tests again. So this runs the tests on the order consumer again, and that's now both the tests um, against the mock version of the address provider, but also against the mock version of the payment provider. And for the pay for the integration with the payment provider, again, it uses 
the traffic to and from the Wiremock instance. And that Wiremock pack generator generates a, well, the contract looks, where is it gone now? Did I just delete? I didn't just delete that, did I? No, I didn't. Um, it looks slightly different, but it's still a valid contract that, that is recognized by Pactflow. So if I upload my contract, publish my contracts again, it will publish both the, ad ad, the contract between the order consumer address provider, but also between the order consumer and the payment provider. And if I refresh this now, I see that I have a third integration uh, between the order consumer and the payment provider. These ones are no longer, this is the, these are the traditional consumer driven contract testing based integrations, but this one, and now has a consumer side contract with expectations that the order consumer has about the behavior of the payment provider uh, with uh, based on the traffic that's being sent to and generated by the Wiremock instance. Um, and this can then be compared to a provider side contract. Um, and that can be, for example, the open API specification um, of the payment provider. So uh, there are, are uh, a couple of different technologies that you can use here. So, and, and the list is growing and growing, but one of the first ones that was supported for the provider contract uh, was open API uh, because it's so, so common. Um, so what I can do is I can also publish this open API provider side contract to the pack broker so that the pack broker can do the verification and comparison between the consumer side contract, which again, that was generated from these YMOC tests and the provider side contract, which is the open API specification. Um, the way to do that right now is um, a bit of an arcane API call that I just do with Postman here right now. So it's an HTTP put to my pack broker and the provider is called the payment provider and the version is 100. The content is just a base 64 encoded version of this YAML file. So if you would decode this, you'll get the YAML file again. Uh, so you see the contract type is OWASP for open API specification. It's a YAML file. Uh, and I can upload some additional verification results. So basically I provide, as, as an audit trail, for example, I can also upload some provider side test results, for example, a test report or whatever. Um, but the most important thing is this one, that's the actual contract itself. And if I send that to, it says 201 created, so something should have happened. And um, indeed something has, because now this is also successful. So uh, the packed broker, in this case packed flow, has successfully compared the consumer side contract generated by the order consumer against the provider side contract, which was the open API specification of the payment provider. And I can even see in more details about that, the contract comparison detail. Well, it's basically just compatible. And I can see details of the consumer contract as well as the provider contract that even uh, renders this. Uh, that's a very simple open API specification, but it, it renders the uh, it render it basically it renders the, the the swagger specification for this API. And this is another way, another type of a way, another way to implement contract testing. Again, 
uh, me doing contract testing doesn't just mean doing consumer driven contract testing that's one way of doing things um but there are other approaches as well and and one that's recently introduced is the one you've seen now it was introduced in march i think of this year so it's relatively new uh which also means uh, that that the list of technologies that are supported is still growing it's growing quite rapidly uh, so you can generate contracts, for example, from Cypress tests, from Postman collections, um, from Wymock mocks, as you've just seen, uh, open API specifications, uh, from rest assured tests for the provider side, uh, and there are a couple more. Uh, I don't know that I've no idea about the complete list, but the, again, the, the, the list is growing and growing. Um, so yeah, just a couple of links, um, to more info about bi-directional contract tests, uh, basically on the packed flow website, you'll see a lot of info about it, a feature announcement and the landing page with all the documentation. Um, and, uh, I told you a little bit earlier about that blog post series that I wrote and the last one, the sixth one in that series uh, specifically, specifically talks about bidirectional contracts. Um, again, all the code that I've shown you is on GitHub as well. So this is a link to the branch for the, the uh, bidirectional contract testing example. But if you remove, well, basically the last part, the slash three slash article six, you go to uh, the main branch, which just contains the code that you've uh, that I've used in the demo of the consumer-driven contact testing, um, and that's my cue to hand it over to Valentina and check if there are any questions. Yes, uh, indeed, indeed, we do have some interesting uh, questions. So. Is end-to-end -end testing the same as integration testing? Uh, what about acceptance tests? Ooh, that is a very good question, Nafa. Um, <laughs> the answer is it depends, of course. <laughs> no. Um, so it depends on it really depends on who you ask. Um, for me, end-to-end -end testing is a form of integration testing because it's um so for me, if you have a look at, and, and, and dare I even say it, at that test automation pyramid thing that so many people talk about, so many people hate, it starts with unit testing. And right at the top, there's end-to-end -to -end testing. And everything in between for me is integration testing. Um, so any test that considers or, or tests different components or layers or even systems as a single entity because you're interested in the behavior of those components as a single thing that's for me an integration test and end-to-end -end testing is a form of integration testing if you look at it that way but i typically reserve end-to-end -end testing for testing the entire application as a whole uh, I'd, I'd much rather call it full stack testing by the way because end-to-end -end testing uh, has a lot of different <laughs> definitions as well um but yeah, so end-to-end -end testing, you can consider end-to-end -end testing a form of integration testing. Um, and what about acceptance tests? Um, yeah, for me, that's... Uh, so end -to -end, unit and integration and end-to-end -end testing, those three terms, they tell me something about the scope of the tests in terms of the components and the layers that you involve. For me, acceptance tests is... That those are tests that are specifically meant to verify some kind of end user or business requirement. Um, and that and you can do acceptance testing through unit tests. You can do acceptance testing through integration tests. You can do acceptance testing through end-to-end -end tests. Um, so and that that's a slightly different view or perspective on um, 
uh, it's it's more about the purpose of the tests rather than the scope of the tests if that makes uh, any sense that's a good way of distinguishing i mean uh, scope uh, for example i mean unit tests everyone does agree that they're essentially in-memory tests, although there are disagreements sometimes between... <laughs> oh, that, that, that's... A, that's a, which we're not going to touch here. But no, uh, that, that, that's a whole different, different kind of worms, yeah. Uh, exactly. And then integration testing is also partially dependent on which unit testing definition uh, you, you agree, you go with. Uh, so oh, yeah. May consider integration testing means when you're integrating with like IO or concerns, so like you know, going beyond in terms of IO, but yet other people might consider even multiple classes to be integration testing. So there's misunderstanding there. The only one where there's not that much misunderstanding is end to end. I think that's the only one where I've seen a relatively unified uh, uh yeah yeah most most mostly mostly, let, mostly. Let, yeah. no absolutely uh, i like how you explained acceptance tests as uh on a different being on a different dimension because it's about someone accepting something so the fact that you took someone's criteria of what it means that they will accept it now which way at which level you write it so let's say someone might have uh, acceptance criteria uh, regarding the way that uh, or the price is calculated. Mm -hmm. Someone might try that through acceptance criteria uh, at unit test level. Someone else might do end-to-end -end testing for everything and write it in Cypress. Uh, it, it, it can even be, and, and that's the kind of test that nobody really talks about, uh, a performance test or a security test. Those can be acceptance tests as well. But no end user really talks about performance acceptance criteria because they don't understand it. And it, yeah, it needs to be fast. That, that that's exactly. typically what you, That's typically what you get. But it's really hard to verify that in a test. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that, yeah. That, that's how I typically re that that's how I like to reason about these. But again, there's um, if you ask five different testers, you probably get six different definitions for this. Yeah, definitely. The, this one is still, I think, an, a permanently open question. The next one is the packed provider a uh, uh, spoof? And here I assume this is referring to single point of failure. Um, I assume <laughs> I so the, I do too, and and as a tester, I can't really assume, but uh, that's that's not what we do. So we ask. But um, what do uh, the, my my question to Nafa is? What do you mean when you say the packed provider? Is that the uh, yeah, is that the provider in terms of an integration? So you have a consumer and a provider. Or do you talk about a packed broker or do you talk about the people who build packed? Um, yeah, maybe this maybe this question needs a, a bit of clarification, but I will not. Yeah, go that would be helpful. Next yeah. one. Yeah. Uh, when the provider, I think this might be linked to the previous one. When the provider is running the tests against the contract, does it include all its dependencies? For example, the database. Um it depends. <laughs> so what you need is um, a running instance of your um, of your provider. Uh, you need an instance that can answer to incoming HTTP calls in this case, or to incoming messages that are being put on some kind of queue or something. Um, what you do on the back end is up to you so again uh, with framework so i use spring here and and my implementation of my provider is horribly horribly simplistic so it's all in memory so that there, there isn't even a database the database is literally um a list i think that's it that's the entire database um but it's up to you to do that so it, it you can do that but you don't have to do that 
Mm -hmm. I think this is definitely a good question because it is. Uh, yeah, I've seen essentially two variants. As okay, the only thing that is required is the provider, like REST API or something, must be running. Now, some people do testing with the real, so the REST API plus the real database. Some people do real REST API plus some uh, mock or, or fake. Uh, database. Mm -hmm. So when there are those instructions to set up um, the data to be in a certain state, so to, to do the state setup, someone, if they have an in-memory uh, database, whether yeah. it's uh, a yeah. fake, fake or mock, then they no, absolutely. That. So you uh, have to modify you the have, real database. You have, you have the freedom to decide there what fits best. So you definitely don't have to include all the benefits. And I'm not even talking about downstream dependencies uh, if the provider uh, calls all kinds of other services again. Um, it's probably a good idea to mock those away anyway. Uh, exactly, because in the end, contract testing, it's not about verifying the full functionality of the thing, but rather like is the REST API uh, how should I say, valid or conforming to the contract. So the database has a bit of a less less importance. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. That. Absolutely. Again, I had that and, and, and uh, I tried to, to address that, make that clear in one of the sheets as well. It's really just about uh, can consumer A talk to provider B and how provider B exactly produces the response doesn't in, in the test. Uh, that doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. It's like implementation detail. Yep. Then next one. Is there a packed mechanism to generate packs from graph QL schemata instead of open API swagger files? Uh, this this is definitely an interesting one. So is it just... That is a good question. And, and I'm literally Googling it right now because I don't know. Um uh i don't know off the top of my head and that's because i don't know the list of all but what i'm going to do is yeah i've mainly seen uh, examples and my current understanding was just regarding rest api but uh, yes yes thing one i, I didn't uh, get by the way, so everything uh, and and with the current client that I'm working with, we're doing we're working with REST APIs, but also with message based APIs, uh, and so APIs that are asynchronous in nature. Uh, it the concept is really just the same. The implementation is a little bit different. Um, so what I is there a chat here in Streamyard that I uh. can. Yes, uh, I mean, the, there's, there's comments uh, here. The comments. Uh, I can't really add something there, I see. But there's private chat. I don't know if this yeah. shows up. Uh, then copy paste this. Into yes. So page. if you go to this page, there on the left side in the menu pane, there's a header called bidirectional contract testing. And that contains a list of all the examples of the different known, of most of the different known integration. I don't see anything related to GraphQL in there, um, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. That's a great, uh, great answer. Yeah, because <laughs> there might be a difference between documentation versus reality, and it Ooh, might. Yes. Be, uh, Ooh, yes. But if it's not on the official page, it might mean that there would be challenges in trying to find uh, how, how yeah. to do it. No, yeah, no, absolutely. But it, um, it, it's definitely something that could be used. And the, the challenge here is that it's, this is all built coming from the open source community. So, and especially all these integrations uh, so the PACT team built the capability of, of, of using open API specs. And they built some of the other ones as well. But a lot of the others, they come from the people who built the tools. So the so there's a 
it, it may be not the Wiremock one itself, but definitely there's also a .NET implementation of Wiremock. And I know for a fact, because I know the person who writes and maintains that, that they added the capability to generate contracts, eh, packed compliant contracts from the .NET version of the Wiremock specification. So a lot of it, again, depends on... Uh, the willingness and the free time of the people in the open source community. Uh, great, great point. Uh, I'm interested yet yeah, to read more about this as well. And this was the clarification to the previous question about single points of failure. So if the packed provider is down, I can't check if I can deploy. Ah, this it, it's, it's your problem. Yeah, Nafa, you're probably talking about the packed broker which is, again, either packed flow or a Docker version of the packed broker. Yes. Um, in that case, it's um, you can see that as a single point of failure because... Um, uh, but it also, it, it's also, it doesn't have to be, but it depends on how dangerously you'd like to live. And you can make that can I deploy step a non-blocking step in your pipeline. And which means that if, if, if something fails, so either the, um, the verification results show you that there's an issue or you can't retrieve the verification results because uh, the pack broker is down. You say, well, I'm going to deploy anyway. Um, that's a little bit beside the point, and it's basically undoing all the effort that you put into implementing contract testing in the first place. Um, so, yeah, that you could see that as a sort, yeah, as a, de a de single point of it. It's a dependency that you introduce, definitely, and it's a definite. It's um, something that you need to take into account when you adopt this. Um, what I didn't mention, by the way, so what I used in the demo is uh, the cloud version of Packflow, so the SaaS version, um, from a certain plan onwards. Again, I told you it's a, it's a um, yeah, it's a commercial product. Uh, you can also host it in your own cloud environment, so uh, you can do an on-premise installation of it as well and you can also use the open source and docker based packed broker which you can also have. so um those are two ways to mitigate that risk because then at least it is um within your own control basically and because you run it you run the packed broker and it's not some third party SaaS product so there are options Mm -hmm. Yeah, th this was definitely a good question. And also some other questions that might be uh, interesting uh, to people. So some of our viewers might be engineering managers or um, developers who are looking to introduce this into companies. From your experience, what kind of sizes uh, uh, in terms of companies are adopting packed flow due to all the licensing time and stuff like that did you find like uh, uh what you know company size seems to be appropriate or what uh product life cycle Ooh. or other factors which affect people's decision making that is a really good question um and i've i've seen it in company i've seen it work successfully in companies of different sizes uh, i don't think the size matters that much um and it's more how flexible are you how easy is it to adopt this how big of a problem is this uh, how distributed is your software architecture if you're still working in a monolithic hey, or or something that looks like a monolithic environment uh, you probably won't get a lot of benefit from this um so it, it's much more um 
to what extent do you do distributed software development? Is, is your application, are your systems uh, and more for, uh, distributed or microservices based or whatever kind of architecture? Um, that's much more a factor than, than just sheer company size, really. Uh, that, that's a good point. So essentially, the extent to which the software is truly distributed would uh, cause someone to have a higher value. But if someone has a monolith or a distributed monolith, then it's going to be much more. It's going to be much more. Yeah, it's going to be less valuable uh, because um, at the whole challenge that I talked about in the beginning of the presentation just isn't as relevant to them it's not that's they may be facing all kinds of all different kinds of problems but that's probably not the problem they're dealing with uh, having to again add, juggle all these dozens or hundreds of different components and trying to get them all together in a testing environment to do their integration testing that's probably yeah. not as big of a problem to them and another also related question is on the earlier slides when you uh, mentioned, you know, this does require, you know, writing tests, which might sound, I guess, common sense, but may maybe, maybe. Isn't. <laughs> uh, I, what, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd hope so, but um, I keep on mentioning it. And, and every time it's a little bit harder if you do a, an online meetup, but if I do this talk or a similar talk at a, at a conference or just in company there's also oh, oh yeah that hurts because it's true because we don't really do that or we oh yeah we should do more of that and we know it everybody knows you should write tests but well as you all probably know uh, knowing that you should do something and actually doing it that's two entirely different things so it might already require the team to have at least uh, some skill set in other forms of uh, writing tests. Uh, oh yeah, and just having having a testable architecture and testable code. Yeah. Yeah. If 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 you're totally unable to just write unit tests for your code, um, it's going to be hard to stick this on top of them. Uh, definitely. So, so this this can work only in a culture where it's already quali quality oriented, where yeah, testing it, is already it, part of practice, and this just it makes is, it so. It, yeah. Again, and, and sorry to interrupt you. Okay, I'm Dutch. That's what we do. I'm sorry, um, <laughs> but um, and when people start with their, this is not typically not the first step in a testing or an automation journey for teams or organizations. Um, this is uh, becoming, uh, it, it's more like, it's more often that the next step that uh, people have their testing down at least to a certain level. They do automation, they have some functional automation, and now they want to extend that to, yeah, but what about all the integrations between the different components? Um, and and that also that you can also look at it from from the other way. If if there's if I start working with with again team or an organization that doesn't have that into place, contract testing is probably not the first thing I'd advise them to do anyway. It, it's let's get let's work with the basics first. Let's first see that you uh, have a solid testing strategy that. Um, you have developers and testers working together to add, do good testing to add, write, hopefully, lots of valuable and useful uh, automation, and only then start looking at, at techniques and, and, and things like this. Uh, exactly, because the foundation is generally, uh, I mean, unit tests and also integration tests in the traditional sense where you're yep. truly integrating with a true instance and end-to-end -end tests. And then only when it becomes painful to do so many end-to-end -end tests and when both the end-to-end -end tests and the integration tests, you can see that they are unstable. I think that's a sort of motivational point uh, 
when yeah. it's like uh, okay uh, it, it makes sense to try contract testing absolutely absolutely yeah so uh i just want to say i really enjoyed this uh, presentation uh i myself well i'm a fan of test automation in in all forms and uh, i see contract testing as something which is not yet too widespread or not well uh, understood so i think it's really great how you covered um, this topic so that people who work in companies who already have some level of test automation can then uh, move on to this uh, next level so yeah i really enjoyed your uh, session and it was really valuable so thank, thank you so much that. thank you thank you for having me and again if, if at some point other questions come up or something um find me on linkedin send me an email uh, i'd love to continue the conversation absolutely and Definitely. thank yeah no thanks to you too valentina for making this possible for having me i love doing talks like this um so um it's been my pleasure absolutely yeah th th thanks again and also thanks to our audience it's uh, re really enjoyed the questions so yeah looking forward also to our uh, future meetups so you can uh, register on meetup to get notified about future meetups also you can like this video and subscribe to us on youtube you can follow us on linkedin and twitter to get notified about future events and also you can ask uh, any technical questions on our uh, github page so um yes uh thanks again and i wish everyone a good day so see you next time bye thank you so much bye bye